Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I just wanted to just introduce you and welcome you to the automotive logistics supply chain section of the conference. We've merged the, oh, we've got uh, co-located conferences here because, of course, of how important logistics is to uh, the IT side and, and so on, and how important, of course, the IT side is to the supply chain industry, and that's what we're going to be talking about over the, over the remainder of the days. But really, I just wanted to make a, just a, a couple of you know, housekeeping points, you might say, uh, to let you know what's happening the rest of the day. Um, after this session, we'll have a, you know, our networking lunch, so please join us for that. That's going to be, again, a combined automotive logistics and automotive IT lunch. In the afternoon, again, we split into two. Uh, we'll, we'll remain split into two with the automotive logistics supply chain sessions remaining in this room. Um, we've got a very exciting session then, looking at some new ideas and what people are doing differently and how it can be done uh, to move the automotive logistics and supply chain industry forward. Uh, and the last session of the day for the automotive logistics supply chain are our very popular automotive logistics think tanks. Uh, so those are when we get into round tables uh, like this and get into smaller groups to discuss specific themes, specific topics. And we always find that, find that there's even more value sometimes from being in smaller groups to have more honest discuss discussions perhaps as opposed to sometimes the fear of asking a, um, a complicated or a question in front of 100 plus people. So please make sure you remain for, for the whole day you can, of course, pop into and go and see and enjoy some of the IT sessions as well. But the automotive logistics supply chain sessions will be in here. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the, the rest of the day and be aware of you know, the, the remaining sessions coming up. We've got some big surprises for you uh, in other sessions as well. And of course, visit the stands and of our sponsors and other people because there's some great things, interesting innovations and so on happening on the stands outside as well. Uh, so that's all I really wanted to say. But I'd like to uh, move on to the session to hear some of the, the great speakers we've got lined up for this panel. And I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our editor, no longer the new editor really, it's been a few months, Joe Giant Perry, the editor of Automotive Logistics, who will be moderating uh, this session. Thank you very much, John. <laughs> Hello and welcome to session two. In this session, we will look at some of the innovations which may disrupt or change automotive logistics as we know it. As Louis mentioned, my name is Joanne Perry and I'm the editor of the magazine. And now I would like to introduce our panel. Um, first, we have Nate Chinenko, manager at Carlisle & Co. Then we have Anu Gohl, Executive Vice President of Group After Sales and Services, Volkswagen Group of America. Jay Johnson, General Manager of the Aftermarket Supply Chain at Daimler Trucks, North America. And finally, Sven Darmani, Principal of Advisory Services at automotive EY. Tier one suppliers so without further delay, I would like to ask Nate to come pretty much his completely to Great. be able to meet much, the Joe. requirements of 21st century Thank you. Uh, auto industry. Hi, everyone. Just to gauge have, who's in the room today, I'm curious to know who is from a I'm manufacturer. Sure a relative in the room newcomer today. to the industry, but a okay. representative of a so completely maybe a third of the room. new type Tier one supplier. of automotive supplier. And automotive okay, is still probably a relatively good. small that helps part me pinpoint of who the tech the companies that are emerging. Let me just give a brief introduction players, to Carlisle but and Company. Is, and we are, are a small strategy consulting firm focused specifically on motor vehicle uh, after sales. Space. So this is the so entirety of the parts and service business. Components and conveniently enough, the way the panel worked out, we work with Lou and Jay and our first speaker is Alex Euler, head of car IT at good consistency up here. You will get a few people from after sales talking to you today. And I want to talk to you about the impact of mobility specifically on the supply chain here. Uh, thank, we heard you, quite a bit this morning um, from Aria, PwC and from uh, the World Economic Forum about how some here. mobility uh, topics may be a company that has coming a about over the next five to ten years. I want to get space. very specific um, and tell you what matters here in the next like, six to 18 how months are and how we can deal with that as an industry. Uh, in specifically for the manufacturers who, who are uh, in the room, value a way that I think your business space. might change. And if you are a tier one supplier or a logistics company, 
supporting one of them, I think this is the world that we now need to be responsive to. Um, so just a couple of brief notes. So I will talk are. to you briefly um, about a recap a, of autonomous bespoke, shared and electric uh, vehicles. Um, and we heard quite a bit about this this morning, Nissan, mostly in a um, long-term outlook company, fashion, and so doing consumer surveys and understanding where people want to end um, up we specialize in five in to ten years or where we think this technology is going. I'm going to tell you about what's happening today, because I think this matters right now. And if we're not prepared for how autonomous um, within the connected car space, electric I run our car IT affects um, center of excellence. Our business immediately. Uh, and this is I think the we're missing the out that uh, maybe losing out in a competitive situation in uh, the infrastructure teams, here. the people who So are this is just three tangible examples, there are many the more, of some of the specific um, development that's happening other in autonomous technology. And this grows as we progress here. So GM's cruise division is an autonomous vehicle division of GM. They have 180 plus vehicles in test, many of which are in California, or some in Arizona. FCA sold 600 um, Chrysler with Pacifica OEM minivans to Waymo. Um, Those are already in full Cyber autonomous security, operation uh, in Phoenix, Arizona right now. Uh, By full autonomous, I mean there so is on. no driver behind the wheel. They only um, operate in a narrow around the area, world, but these are actually on the road. In, in the UK, so this is an example Keynes, of why we, we need to be responsive. In that office. And um, just in I'm case you are office, thinking if you're from a manufacturer or if you're from a logistics company and your main manufacturer clients are not um, so we have developing Kuwait, autonomous Japan. technology the last aggressively. Year we you can look to Volvo, uh, who is developing their own autonomous technology, but has also sold 24,000 of their most expensive top so trim before getting into the topic at hand, to Uber, wanted to share where a quote Uber from, will install uh, Barr, their the own rack, of GM. which you can see here, um, of autonomous recently, driving she, technology she, she and sensors the automotive on the roofs of the vehicles. So even if your company or your client's customer company is not developing their own technology, this will affect you in the near future. There are also quite a few shared mobility options, and the shared mobility options that we all know about are Uber and Lyft, and as I just mentioned, Uber is buying thousands of cars. Other ride-hailing companies like Waymo are also buying tens of thousands of cars. Waymo bought 20,000 of them from uh, Jaguar Land Rover just recently, the I-Pace, their new vehicle. There are also a few of these non-traditional options, Care by Volvo, Porsche Passport, and Book by Cadillac, that are fractional ownership. It's it's like you would get a car rather than a three-year lease, you would sign up for a six-month lease or a three-month lease or a one-month lease. And then in Porsche Passport and Book by Cadillac, you can exchange cars. And these fleets of vehicles are owned by, in most cases, owned by the manufacturer. And then there is electric vehicle technology here. And we think people don't like electric vehicle technology. This is not a good fit for the American market, but it's certainly not stopping OEMs from investing billions of dollars, collectively tens of billions of dollars, in electric vehicle technology to be released over the next few years. Most of this is to comply with European and Chinese standards. The Chinese auto market is now the biggest in the world, and if you can't deliver electric vehicles at scale, you can't be competitive with their mandates. If you're going to develop the technology, you might as well make that available in the United States as well. So this is just three slides. There's far more detail I could go into, but with the remaining time, I want to spend this on some other topics. But we think there is an immediate impact here, and that manufacturers, suppliers, and logistics companies need to respond to this immediately. And here's why. I think that fleet ownership is coming to the world of automotive. We historically in truck, and Jay I'm sure can speak to this better than I can, this is a 64% of vehicles. This is zero to seven year UIOs. So units in operation from zero to seven year old for truck are 64% fleet owned. The new vehicle sales is upwards of 95% in truck to fleets. In auto, that number is zero to seven year, 6.8%. So about 10% the size is fleet owned. And at 6.8%, I can run an auto company effectively without really worrying too much about fleet sales. And certain companies, especially our US domestic OEMs, Volkswagen, Nissan, or two more, they rely heavily on fleet sales from the vehicle sales perspective. But historically, we have lost this business to the, um, to the aftermarket. And I'm talking about the business of servicing fleet vehicles. So fleet vehicles have tighter parts margins. Fleets, are, fleets have far more buying power. And rather than being a price taker, so when I go to the dealer and I need to buy an oxygen sensor, they tell me it's $200. If I am a fleet and I go to the dealer to buy many oxygen sensors, I would tell them 
I'd like to pay $140 or else I will go buy this from the parts aftermarket, not from the manufacturer. So this is a big risk for automotive companies who are not used to selling service parts into a fleet environment. Fleets also are more likely to perform their own service for vehicles. We call this self-service. This also hurts part sales. Companies, fleet companies who are comfortable and capable of performing their own service are unlikely to use genuine parts when they do so. And fleets also, and this is key to the next point in the discussion, have an enormous focus on uptime. And anybody in the room who's from a truck manufacturer like Jay knows that uptime is not a new concept in truck at all. Uptime has been an enormous focus of truck for years, decades almost. And we also have this concept, I was speaking to Philippe who happens to be sitting in the front here from CMW yesterday. Airlines have this and they call it aircraft on ground. And this is the idea that the fleet cannot generate revenue if the vehicle doesn't move. So if a truck only makes money for the time that it's actually shipping goods from point A to point B, if the truck doesn't move, the fleet is not making money. If my car sits in the driveway because I need a brake job and it takes two days to get fixed, I can take an Uber, I can take Lyft, my wife can drive me, I can ride my bicycle, I can take the bus. I have other options, but if there's a trailer full of cargo, there's really no other option. And what we think the connection here is autonomous vehicles, and this is back one slide here, will start to look a lot more like fleet vehicles, primarily because they are so catastrophically expensive. Um, so our speaker from PwC this morning, Janet, mentioned that the high cost of these may be a uh, barrier to growth. I think the high cost is a barrier to personal ownership of autonomous vehicles. But the high cost almost pushes us towards a fleet-owned system, and then the networks scale so effectively that autonomous vehicles are already getting sold into these big fleets. So we saw here on this early slide that we had 24,000 Volvos sold to Uber for fleet use. We had 20,000 Jaguar I-Paces sold to Waymo for fleet use. This transition to fleet ownership is already happening in the automotive world, and auto is going to start looking a lot more like truck. Here. So we do have some ideas about what to do with this. We can learn a lot from aircraft engines and airframes. In the airline industry, there's been a concept since the 1960s called power by the hour. Um, this is essentially the concept that rather than the airline pay for parts and service, they pay for every hour that the plane is up in the air able to be flown for revenue generating purposes. So the concept here of power by the hour is old, almost ancient old at this point. We can take that concept and think about why this works for automotive as well. And this is a great setup in comparison with what we have today, where fleet operators will pay for parts and service. This would be on the left here. So we have the traditional airlines here who would own their own planes. They would pay for their own parts and service. The manufacturer, of course, so if you're Rolls Royce or Pratt & Whitney and you make aircraft engines, you want to sell parts to make money. These parts are exceptionally profitable and this is really where most of the margin is for aircraft engine and airframe manufacturers. But the airline doesn't care, they don't wanna buy parts, they just want the plane to fly. Because if the plane doesn't fly, they can't move the people. So when you look at EasyJet and some other discount carriers, they are operating in a guaranteed uptime or a power by the hour environment. Where, and here, this is key, the airline pays per hour of uptime. That means that the manufacturer and the servicer, so Rolls-Royce and their service partners, want the aircraft to be up and running. And so does the airline. So all of our incentives are aligned here. This is really what we've been pushing the auto industry towards over the last few months, because this is the way to recapture that lost fleet business that would typically go to a very low cost aftermarket provider. So for manufacturers or those of you in the room who are supporting manufacturers, enabling uptime and guaranteed uptime in this way is critical to retaining your genuine part sales and ultimately if the manufacturers are one of your customers, retaining your customer's business. There are a few tangible effects on the logistics business specifically here. So if you are guaranteeing uptime, you need the vehicles, whatever they may be, to run as much as possible. This means that the part composition may change. So if you're actually a tier one supplier and you're making parts, you may be asked to make a part that's more physically robust with a longer service interval because now service costs money. And we can measure that now. We know exactly how much lost uptime costs us. This always used to be a value judgment. You know, how much customer goodwill am I willing to give up 
to take another day to get a part over to my customer. And now we have a specific number on that, and it's the cost per hour for uptime. So you can see that here. So if you are a logistics company trying to move things very quickly, critical order speed now matters a great deal more than it may have in the past. That extra three to four hours of downtime can cost hundreds or thousands of dollars per vehicle. And over an entire fleet of 25,000 or 100,000 vehicles, this really starts to add up in the after sales world. We also care about inventory costs more, um, where we may be willing to pay to store more inventory in the warehouse network than we've historically been willing to store. And we really care a lot about making sure that the end customer for manufacturers, who's ultimately the dealer or the service <coughs> point, has the parts in stock when they need to be in stock. So again, the impact on logistics is huge. If you can't get parts to where they need to go and they need to be there, now your customer is about to start adding that up and telling you what this costs them in terms of lost uptime. And if you're not prepared to make that calculation, your customer may choose to go somewhere else to conduct their business. There are a few more impacts on the service side of the business that I am out of time to discuss today. And I just wanted to end up with 10 more seconds on why we think that this is tricky. So in particular, this is related to automotive. There are federal regulations here that are at play. Aircraft, of course, are heavily federally regulated in the US by the Federal Aviation Administration. Um, we don't have those restrictions in automotive, which means that the barrier to entry to service is lower. This actually makes it even more of a challenge for manufacturers and tier one suppliers to capture this business. We have a service delivery where we de currently deliver services to cars through the dealer channel. They represent another point in that margin chain where we may feel like dealers are taking some margin out of the process. That's one more stakeholder we need to get to agree with us. And then also, and this is most critically the key point here, pricing a guaranteed uptime is really challenging. So oftentimes we struggle enough with just identifying exactly what the landed cost is for a part or what you should charge your customer for that part to get it to their shores. <clears throat> now you need to charge them for that part. You need to think about how many hours of labor will be required to install that part, how frequently it's going to need to be operated on, what the failure rate is, and all of these things need to roll up to what is ultimately a cost per mile. And the cost per mile for uptime is what we think automotive customers and truck customers are going to start looking for as the industry moves more towards fleet ownership. So that's all for me. I will pass this back to Joanne for the next introduction. Thank you, Thank you very Thanks much, everyone. Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. I think you said a lot there that we could pick up on in the Q and A session, which we will do at the end of the um, at the end. And um, next, I think Anu would like to say a few words, and I believe he has a video as well. All right. Good morning. All right. Good morning. I'm going to stay sitting. Um, I've got one slide for you and then a video, but just a couple uh, thoughts. The title of the session is um, Automotive Supply Chain um, Disruption or Adjustment. Right? I, I had the opportunity to attend. Ever been to a TED Talk? Yep. I had a chance to attend a TED Talk session on uh, the campus of the University of Michigan, and the title of the conference was um, Dreamers or Disruptors? Right? So we've got disruptors and adjustment here. To me, this is more about dream, dreamers and disruptors. And which one you think it is, I think, says a lot about how you approach it. Right? To, to me, it's, if you think it's a disruption, then you're going to be trying to protect the turf you've got, and it's shrinking. And if, if you view it as a dreamer, you're going to find new revenue streams, new ways of approaching the business, all the stuff that, that Nate was talking about. Right? You saw the fleet mix that he showed for cars at 6.8%. I was reading an article the other day that said between uh, Uber, Lyft, and Google, they'll be buying over five million cars and trucks in the U.S. a year. That's about a third of the market with those three companies. What are the service requirements? What are the logistics requirements of servicing Lyft, of servicing Uber across the country, right? Where do you do it? Is it a dealership, independent repair shop? All that kind of stuff, right? So there's a lot that goes into it. So what Louie and uh, Joe had asked me to um, just take you a little bit through, and, you can look at this for the um, finished vehicle logistics movement um, for us and from us, Germany, Mexico, U.S., through our ports to our dealers. You can look at this for the service part supply chain. You can look at this as the vehicle purchase. You can break this down into various chains. But what, what you have up here on the screen is just a simple depiction of what the service process is today, right? You have the appointment. You have repair order preparation. You, ha you have the vehicle arriving at the dealership. 
you have the vehicle being repaired, you've got the quality control service and delivery, you get the handover back to the customer in the building, then you follow up with them, and then it, it just starts again, right? So that's the service process that OEs go through when dealing with customers. So you hear the terms e-mobility, digitalization, and one of the things I always find interesting is you're asking a, a mid-50s um, Asian American to talk about digitalization, right? Go grab a six to eight year old and they'll be able to explain it to you better than I can, right? Because I'm still old school, right? I started working in the mid 80s, I've been through Ford Motor Company, et cetera. But if we don't set the groundwork and if we don't structure our organizations and thought process properly, we miss the boat because as Nate showed you, it's here. It, this is done, right? So the question is, how are you preparing for it? How do you adjust for it? So rather than me talking, I figured I'd, uh, I just walk you through a quick video. It's a little under two minutes, and then I'll give you a couple closing thoughts before we turn it over to Jay. All right? So we could run the video. And there's nothing in there that isn't being done today, right? So to me, the way this has to be approached or what the best way to look at this is we want to give customers back the gift of time. We want to meld all of this into their lifestyle seamlessly, right? So you, you saw at the end, you know, the car drives away by itself, right? So you've got autonomous driving built into this. It's picking up things for the customer from wherever right, while they're at work, it could be running Uber runs for all it's worth, right, as a revenue generating deal um, for that specific vehicle owner, right? So you give them back the time, you meld it in their lifestyle seamlessly, and the challenge for us is to figure out how to do that. Because is there anything in there that, that you saw that you wouldn't want, right? So all that stuff's there today. The challenge, the next step challenge here is what's not in there? What's next? And that's how we got to start thinking. And I don't think organizations can approach it and think about it unless they're structured if, for it properly, right? Are you, are you bringing in the right level of talent, right? People that think like this from other industries, right? You start what Nate showed you about the uh, airline industry, right? With uptime, with fleets, with uptime. If we, aren't, if we just look internally, we're lost. So we've got to look at how this is done. Bigger picture, what's out there, what, what our customers want, the surprise and delight. And the interesting thing is whenever you ask customers what they want, they have a hard time telling you, but when they see it, touch it, feel it, smell it, they can tell you if they like it or don't like it. Right? And that's, that's how we got to be. Um, and if this is part, if this is seven hours of your 60-hour work week, you're not going to get there. It's got to be dedicated, focused, and driving it. Right? So take everything that you hear out there, e-mobility, digitalization, autonomous vehicles, shared vehicles, 
bring it all together, seamless, customer focused. And, that's, and that'll help you generate new revenue streams because you hear things like electric vehicles will take away 30 to 40 percent of traditional parts maintenance and for most OEs, that's a profit engine for a company. Right? So you can look at it as, oh, it's shrinking, or you can look at it as, what else is out there in this model that we just showed you that can help us generate revenue that the customer is willing to pay for? Right. So with that, turn it back to Joe. Next up, we have Jay Johnson from Daimler. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I think we're still morning, and thank you, Anu. I think I'm very similar to Anu. I started in this business 30 years ago, but I spent 17 years in the automotive side, and then I was recruited into the truck side in one of those uh, Daimler days. So I think disruption and adjustment are both key. Um, disruption, I think I have to be the disruptor in and Anu alluded to that internally in our organization. So what do I need to do to encourage my team to be different, how to look at it different, or even look for a new team where I need to? So an adjustment, I think, is what we're constantly doing. I think Nate alluded to it from the uptime side of it. Um, so it's very key to the way we want to do our business um, going forward. I thought I'd start out with just a photo I could. Um, you know, a lot of times I say I'm from Daimler, Daimler Trucks, and people say Daimler Chrysler. Uh, Chrysler and Daimler split uh, over 10 years ago. Um, Daimler is basically three divisions, and uh, Daimler Trucks, I have all the brands represented here. Um, most people know us for our car division that's based right now up the road here in Sandy Springs um, and in Georgia. But on the truck side of the business, our headquarters is in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we have a sales and after sales group here in, in Charlotte area. But um, one of the things about Daimler, um, you, you know, maybe a lot of people, it's, we were talking, Anu and I, about the size of the company. Um, you know, Volkswagen's more than 400,000 employees. Daimler's like almost 300,000 employees around the world, um, whether it's in cars or trucks. But you can see some of the product lines that we have here. Uh, one of the ones up in the far right corner is, is our new Cascadia. Um, and, in, and in the transportation business, and I think we have a lot of logisticians here, you know, it's key to have a great product that's going to provide, as Nate said, uptime, um, as well as fuel efficiency. And we have what we believe to be the most fuel efficient product on the road today. Um, and we're focused on, on the uptime side of the business. So I came to the Daimler Trucks um, part of this business about eight years ago. Um, I was in Japan before that. And one of the things that surprised me was just maybe how, how we weren't advanced in the way we distributed our products in North America. Um, and it was nothing new. Um, the auto industries used dedicated delivery service for 20, 30 years, but in the truck side of the business, we weren't doing that. Uh, we were primarily utilizing LTL for our shipments, and you know, a lot of that for a stock order. Emergency critical, we'd use airplanes, but a lot of it was we weren't getting the parts there in an expeditious fashion. So we started to change, and this is a company idea of how do we change our company culture? How do we become more customer focused as a, as a group. How do we, and I liked earlier this morning, it talked about fast beats slow. And we're trying to look at how we become faster. So in 2013, um, our CEO at that time issued what we call the 72 hour challenge. And you say 72 hours, that sounds like a long time to repair a truck. Well, the repairs were taking a lot longer than 72 hours and I'm sure a lot of people in this room that utilize those products to understand that. Um, you know, a lot of the fleet business, we do sell primarily to fleets. Uh, like Nate showed, it's, it's more than 60%. Fleets will typically handle the easy stuff, the maintenance, change the oil, the filters, and a few other things. But the heavy stuff like an overhaul or repair an engine or brakes or 
anything major after treatment, it, it usually comes into our dealer network. Uh, so one of the things that we worked on extensively, um, and every OE wants their dealer network, you know, to represent them well, because we don't typically sell parts direct. We do to some of our fleets. We're unique in that business. We do sell parts direct to some of our fleets. We sell trucks direct to some of our fleets, but primarily most of our business is done through our dealer network. And we have what we wanted to demonstrate by this, we have one of the largest dealer networks across the United States. And we've worked with our dealers, um, tried to treat them more as a partner. And we've created a program called Elite Support. And actually the criteria to become Elite Support dealer is determined not by the OE, but by, by the dealers themselves. So we actually sit on the board and it actually gets more involvement, but I should have brought some before and after photos. You wondered how anybody had any business with some of the dealerships, the way they looked before. But now a lot of them are clean. It's the same as any continuous improvement project. We started to, we looked at our, our network and said, we can't support the future of the business as we were in 2010, 2011. So we went on a capital campaign and most of the times, I, I was talking to Louie, most of the times the CEO doesn't call somebody in the supply chain to say, great job, he's telling you what you'd missed or how bad it is. But our CEO listened to us when we said, we have to get closer to our partners. So we've actually added three PDCs. 2016, we added Dallas. 2017, we added Indianapolis. And 2018, we added Des Moines. And 2019, we'll add one more. And our goal is to really get to 90% of our dealers will get a stock order next day um, with no membership fee. And we, be, we believe that is a competitive advantage um, to really servicing and keeping uptime there. But we didn't do just that as far as our network approach. We also created a program for our dealers so they wouldn't have to order parts individually at the dealership. We have a retail inventory management program that helps the dealer put the right stock on the shelf. So we created that, we, we gave that to our dealers as a tool, and we saw some of our dealers have almost 20 points better fill at the counter. So we know if you, if you don't have the part or you can't get the part fairly rapidly, the business is gone. So we really invested, we've invested in that, but it doesn't go alone. It has to go in conjunction with other programs and a lot of them I put in a very simple pattern called Plan, Do, Check, Act. And part of it is how do you plan and we focus on new planning software, but a lot of it goes with the people aspect. And uh, we had to really evaluate our people before and, and we worked hard to do that and we went on, I went, personally on a recruiting mission for a lot of the people. And we, we actually had the experience in the planning side of the business about a 75% turnover in people in the last five to six years. We've, through that, we've also partnered with a couple of universities to look for talent, uh, new talent, young talent, people that understand the digital age and aren't afraid. Um, we had people that we hired in as clerks 25, 30 years ago we gave them about eight months to a year to find a new job, and I was proud to say that 80% of them found a new job inside the company in another area, but we had to get talent into the organization that would support us. One of the things I think that Louis picked, um, called me up and said, hey, I see you guys are doing 3D printing. Uh, that's pretty novel, you know, in the aftermarket side of the business. We have printed 3D parts. Uh, we started a project about three years ago. We picked one of our new, young, talented staff to try to make into a 3D expert. And I said, we've got to print something. Let's just do it. Uh, so we've got about six parts, seven parts out there. They're not big. They're not high volume. It's a learning lab right now. Um, but we want to utilize that as a footprint to step into the future. We have to learn to crawl before we walk and run. So we've already started that, and through that whole process, we engaged a couple of universities, and the excitement from the students really helped excite our people. 
Um, and the students in the universities were, were extremely helpful in just giving us the ideas and what we should try to pursue for the future. Um, and I've categorized those all under the alternative supply solutions, 3D printing parts, because a lot of times we support products that, like some of the school buses, we, we had a request for a 40-year-old school bus part. We have some contracts with the government that are 30 years that we have to still have parts for. We have other contracts that we have to support for a long time, 30 years, you know, millions of miles on the road. So the dynamic of trying to have those parts available, you know, with some of the suppliers that are in the room, it's, it's very challenging. So we're, we're looking at alternatives to better manage that into the future. That's why we said, hey, let's do 3D printed parts. Let's look at 3D printed tools. We actually kicked off a 3D printing tool uh, concept uh, last year. And we think that we can print a 3D tools to run low volume, like that 25-year-old truck or 20-year-old truck. We can get some of that back. And then we also are looking at some strategic supplier coordination, where we have some suppliers that maybe we only ordered a part from five years ago. But we have some partners that do regular business with that supplier. We're looking at how to do better and more coordinated um, business with them. Um, and I know I had short time, so I kind of sped through a lot of it just to give you an idea of what we try to do as an organization to transform. Thought I would leave you with just the final photo. Um, couldn't get the rights to show him transform because the movie, we, have to, we actually own the truck, but we have to get the rights from uh, the movie studios to show any transformation. But just to give you an idea of our organization, what we're doing today, and we believe that transformation has to continue into the future. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, next up, we have Sven from EY. Thank you, Joe. Great. So <clears throat> I think we've heard quite a bit about uh, the service side of the business. I'm going to zoom out a little bit and talk broadly uh, about supply chain. And I think, you know, um, we, we talked a little bit about, we heard a little bit earlier from Alex about, you know, <clears throat> the magnitude uh, and the impact uh, that's going to be seen in the next 10 years. I mean, Industry 4.0 is unlike any, any other. And, you know, just as an example of the magnitude of impact, um, you know, I give an example of a candle and a light bulb. Uh, a light bulb wasn't invented from continuous improvement of a candle. And what you're going to see is we're going to see a concurrent uh, adjustment and disruption. So you're going to still have candle getting better and less smoke and adding fragrance and burning longer, but then you're going to see a light bulb as well. Um, so you're going to see both of those concurrently and disruption driving you know, pretty significant change uh, in our landscape in supply chain in automotive. So why, why is that? So, <clears throat> um, and I apologize, Joe, I'm going to stand in front of you a little bit here. Uh, but if you think about your traditional supply chain, this is the current model, right? In most part, what we see is it's really an organization um, with boundaries, right? You have suppliers on one side. They have their own ID systems. We exchange some data. You know, we have OEM, within OEM, we have pretty good integration of data now, but, and then we have dealers, which are a separate legal entity, um, and they have their own set of data, right? There is exchange, there is interaction, we are being very collaborative, we are sending a lot of EDIs back and forth, but it's still a supply chain, and I think that's probably how the word supply chain came into play, because it's really a chain. Where it's really moving to in the future is a network. That's where it's going. Uh, and that's the biggest disruption that we are going to see in our lifetime in the supply chain. It's going to move from, I'm going to have a linear uh, movement of information. Uh, and, and Renee pointed out this morning, data is going to be the big key. Right now, from the time when a dealer sends a signal to say, you know, the mix is really changing. I'm moving more towards, you know, 
um, compact SUVs from cars, you know, it takes several months within the organization and then another couple of months until the signal fully gets to a supplier, right? So there is a lag. What you're gonna start to see in the future is, is simultaneous sharing, real-time sharing of information. How's it gonna happen? It's gonna happen with blockchain, it's gonna happen with IoT, it's gonna happen with advanced analytics, it's gonna happen with cloud. It's gonna be a combination of, of a lot of things, but <clears throat> those are some fundamental blocks that are gonna drive disruption of our supply chain. So that's what is changing. Um, and, and so <clears throat> what, what, what are some of these elements that of, um, you know, I'll say digital supply chain um, that we'll see in the future? So <clears throat> let me, I'm not gonna go through all of these. Let me take a few examples. Um, probably many of you know EY. We are a $30 billion company, uh, 250,000 employees all over the world. So we're pretty big. Uh, 50,000 roughly in consulting, and I, I, I'm, I'm in supply chain automotive. I lead that globally. Uh, one of the experiments we did ourselves, uh, and we eat our own dog food, so we did an experiment using RPA, robotic process automation. And we did a few pilots, um, and we saved $40 million last year. So this year, we're actually going to save $250 million through company wide deployment of RPA. Um, that's a lot. That's almost 1% of our global revenue worldwide. Um, I mean, those are, that's just one example of what we're doing. You'll probably ask, well, how do you do that? Well, <clears throat> you know, we have 250,000 employees. We send a lot of people to training. Um, they all register for classes. The bot goes and checks their training schedule against their travel. So if I'm coming to Atlanta for training and two weeks in advance, I haven't yet booked my airline ticket, the bot sends out a message to the person saying, hey, you haven't booked your ticket, go book your ticket because the price is gonna go up tomorrow, right? So just from that one activity, we save a couple of hundred dollars per employee per training. Multiply that by 250,000, that's just one example of how RPA is disrupting. Imagine how boring of a job that would be to go through everybody's training schedule and like look at their travel schedule. Nobody would want to do it, right? We're working similarly with clients right now, an automotive client, where <clears throat> they're looking at you know, the, the demand uh, side, signal coming from supply, uh, the dealers, and looking at their own schedules and saying, you know, does my schedule match roughly what my suppliers, are, what my dealers are looking for? And it's a cumbersome task with you know, hundreds of Excel spreadsheets, which is, Unfortunately, our ERP of choice um, these days, but somebody has to go through those spreadsheets with you know, 600 columns and 2,000 rows and try to match it up. Uh, that's you know, being, as a pilot, being automated. Um, so that's another example of uh, <clears throat> you know, how things are changing, how things are getting disrupted. Let me give you another example. Uh, blockchain, uh, we heard this morning as well. You know, how is blockchain going to redefine the way we do business? Um, all OEMs and even suppliers have tier two directed buys. So how do I know that my sub-suppliers are getting the right price that I negotiated with my tier two directed buy, uh, and they're getting it in a timely fashion, as well as they're actually getting it from the right suppliers. They're not going to a different supplier. Blockchain creates complete transparency because it's not, um, you can't go back and edit a record. You can go and add to the record, so it's, and there is a complete uh, transparency within that private network to say, you know, where was this part created, where it got added, and when it moved from point A to point B. Uh, I mean, these days, uh, you can even scan a bottle of uh, wine and get the lineage of where the grapes were grown, um, where they were processed, where they were you know, fermented, and where they were bottled, right? So if you can do that, why can't we do it with cars? Why can't we apply that to a product issue, instead of recalling millions of cars, we can have a digital twin and we can just recall 300 cars which actually had a problem. Instead of scanning, you know, recalling a million cars and 99.9% .9 there's nothing wrong with it. Imagine the amount of waste that happens in that process. Because we don't have a digital twin, because we don't have blockchain that can actually track where the part went. So, these are some of the examples of um, um, you know, 
<clears throat> what we are seeing in the market, we are actually, we've also implemented um, artificial um, reality, augmented reality uh, for servicing tools. We talked about digital printing of tools. Uh, if you have to service tools, you don't service them very often. Uh, think of a big mold or a big die. It, it gets serviced probably once a quarter, maybe sometimes a little more than that, more often like once every six months. So think about the time spent in thinking through the instructions or having a misstep and having a die get damaged or broken. So with augmented reality, you can provide um, the operator step-by-step -step instructions and say, here's the step one, here's where you do it, here's how you release the latch, here's where you open the screws and take the tool apart. Um, so in, imagine the efficiency you get from augmented reality. Similarly, IoT, so there, you know, these are a few examples uh, I wanted to share which are in play right now and driving value right now, hundreds of millions already, and we're just scratching the surface. Um, so there is a lot, there's a lot um, you know, of, um, I'll say, opportunities out there, uh, and uh, advanced analytics, uh, machine learning. I've uh, done three projects in the last six months where, where we've improved forecast accuracy uh, between 20 and 40 percent at three different clients, um, automotive. So imagine if you can plan 40 percent better of what your forecast is, you can plan your production better, you can plan your supply better, There's, your suppliers can have the right raw materials, you're eliminating a lot of expedites and overtimes. Uh, imagine the efficiency you can get out of it. So combined with all of these, uh, you know, we anticipate the leaders in the industry are going to get, you know, 25 to 30 percent improvement in productivity. That's massive. Um, that's like me getting extra eight hours a day. I would love that. I can sleep a lot more. Um, so, so that's some of the things we are seeing uh, in the industry that are going to be disruptive. So, what, what are what are what are we seeing in terms of changes? How are we? How do you get started? Right. What we are seeing is a lot of companies are right now over here. They have a digital focus. They recognize the value. They recognize the importance. And they've started doing projects. They have a labs. Um, you, know, you mentioned you're doing 3D printing. Um, there are a lot of experiments, pilots, proof of concepts. And that's where we see a lot of, uh, oops, how do I go back? Let's see. Yeah, there you go. Um, so we're seeing a lot of activity in this space. I think. We are starting to see some movement from projects to programs, which is, how do I create a program? Let me figure out how I need to drive value. How do I take 10% you know, cost out of my manufacturing process? Hmm, maybe I can use smart energy management, which actually looks at what I'm producing and the mix I'm producing and how much energy and utilities I consume. And maybe I can shift the pain process at night when the load is low and I can go back to the utility company and renegotiate my rates because I'm helping them load balance, right? So, so starting to look at what's my end-to-end -end value chain and how do I drive value efficiency improvement in the value chain? Where you know, <clears throat> we, we see uh, a lot of companies going next is really uh, embedding digital in your DNA, right? Making it a part of everything you do. It's not a separate activity. It's not a separate initiative. Digital is integrated into everything. And uh, you know, we at EY, um, we don't have a separate digital supply chain. Digital is in everything we do. It's in manufacturing, smart factory, you know, energy management, things like that. It's in procurement. Um, it's in planning, machine learning, uh, AI. Um, and it's in even a part of strategy, which is you know, what is my future operating model? How can I design it to be agile and responsive? And I think that's where, that's where the future is. So, you know, <clears throat> going back to finishing up where I started, um, you know, we really believe that you're going to see disruption and I improvements happening at the same time. So you're going to see the candle get, you know, last longer, have, less, have no smoke, have a nice smell, but then you're going to see bulbs getting built and invented every day. So um, I, I think it's a little bit of both, and it's a really exciting time. Um, I think you know we we are underestimating the amount of change we'll see in the you know five to ten year horizon. So I'm excited to see what the future holds. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, wow.
Wow. So we, we covered a lot of ground there and, and some big topics. And um, I think there should be lots of questions. I know I've got lots, but I would first like to invite the audience um, to ask any questions or even just make a comment. If you would like to do so, just put your hand up and uh, somebody will come with a microphone. And if you could state your name and your company and then ask your question. Any questions? Okay, so um, I'll start off with one of mine, and um, I think I'd like to start with electric vehicles. Um, so I know that a lot of manufacturers are integrating the electric vehicles with conventional vehicles on their production lines, and my question would be, is this integration also happening with the storage of components for these vehicles? Are the EV components and the conventional vehicle components being stored in the same places? For the truck side of the business, um, our electric commercial vehicle right now is, the offering is a canter for the all of Daimler. So we're only in the beginning side of that business. Um, but you're right, there, we are evaluating preparations because it's very different. It's hazardous material handling. So we, we have, out of the nine PD, PDCs that I operate, we only have one that's certified to manage that right now. So we're actually commissioning an evaluation. We don't see in the truck business that um, long haul trucking will be instantaneously moving to you know, EV vehicles. Um, we know, we, we saw Tesla's rollout. We're very well aware of it. We actually read in the newspaper they might be giving up on their commercial vehicle, but we won't because that's our business. Um, we're evaluating um, our own electric commercial vehicle for the long haul, but a big part of it is how do we manage, reprocess, and store those components mainly around the batteries. And then uh, we, from our side of the business, we look at uh, the handling of batteries in four ways because the handling will determine how you physically store and um, transport these things. So we, could, we refer to it as the four R's. You can either repair it, either replace it, you recycle it, or you repurpose it. And right now we are not doing that through our depots. Right? We are using third-party providers because we have found that they are better at it than we are near term, simply because the volume's not there and it's new to us. But the answer on how these will be stored and handled I believe will be different for each of those four R's. Uh, for and, and just to add to that, I think if you really think about the supplier network where the parts are going to come from, you know, the, the internal combustion engines have pistons and crankshafts and camshafts and you know, engine blocks, right? Whereas we have you know, electric motors, right? Different technologies coming from different suppliers. So it's probably going to end up being uh, you know, almost an independent network. Uh, for the powertrain, you know, from the chassis and you know exterior, interior, you know, you'll you'll have a, you know a, a gradual shift, but you know from a powertrain perspective, it's a different supply. In most part, it's a different supplier base, so your network is going to look a lot different than it does for you know the uh, internal combustion engine. The good thing is the shift isn't happening overnight, so there's some time to plan and you know, strategize on how we adapt to that yeah, change. And, and just to build on that a little bit, to think about what will happen in dealerships, right? Because the purpose of showing that video was the customer view. What are the logistics processes behind it to support that customer view, right? That's the open question and how you handle it. Think about dealerships. People working on these vehicles are going to be master electricians. Mm -hmm. yep. There's already an industry shortage on techs in dealerships, right? So where are we going to get people that are certified master electricians to work on these vehicles in our, in our dealerships. I mean, there's a lot that goes into this. Any comment from the audience? There's a question at the I back. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Yep. Hi, I'm, uh, can you hear me? Yep. I'm Terrence Brown with Rider Transportation, specifically with Coop on the truck sharing side. I have a question for the gentleman from Daimler, uh, but the panel as a whole. Do you believe there's, uh, with the advent of the sharing economy, do you believe there's room in your specific business model for truck sharing with, uh, between businesses? 
between businesses. Right now, there's a lot of truck sharing. That's what the fleets optimize the use of the truck. We have, a, we have several fleets that, that will operate a truck for 24 hours like an industrial piece of equipment. So the operator is sharing that equipment. You mean sharing across ownership boundaries? Um, you mean like there is a view of that and actually our colleagues in Europe are experimenting with it first. Here, you know, one of the primary um, sponsors here, Ryder as well as Penske, are two very large companies that already share that product that they offer. Um, we don't see it coming to the U.S. right away, but we're watching very carefully what happens in Europe. Okay, any more questions? Yep. Hello, Kerry Zelensky from Syncreon. Um, with all this change going on in the future with autonomous and so forth, do you see an increase of 3PL business or a decrease in 3PL business as we go forward? Are you going to insource more? You can, oh, I couldn't hear the question. Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? More 3PLs. So with all the change that's going on with autonomous vehicles and parts yeah. and aftermarket and so forth happening, do you see the industry of 3PLs okay. increasing in work or decreasing in work because of the need to control as we move forward with the new technology? So are yeah. 3PLs going to grow or are they going to pick up the change in little portions? Do you want to control the change? Um, all right, I'll, I'll take a shot at it first. It, it's an interesting question. I think part of it gets back to how do you view the value add of a 3PL? Right? I mean, traditional has been when a company comes in, they're starting up and they don't have the network and the footprint that like Jay was talking about, the buildings and closer to the customer. You go leverage 3PL, and then if you decide the customer service is a core competency, mm -hmm. um, you usually find a business case that says bring it in house, insource it. Right? It, that's typically how it goes. Um, and p part of what goes along that school of thought is that a 3PL will not provide the level of service or ownership for the customer experience that you as the OE want to have right, wrong, or indifferent. Okay? Um, if you take the autonomous vehicles, the e-mobility, electric vehicles, et cetera, I believe you're going to have a similar um, track. What I talked about with the electric vehicle battery handling that we have today, we're, we're utilizing 3PLs. Okay? Um, I think it might be a little bit different in this case. Um, I, 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 I view us as using them. We're using them now. I view that as expanding um, going forward. But at some point, we'll have to make a decision on can we, is that a core competency and do we want to do that in-house? This is dangerous goods, right? There's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. If you take a look, if you have a battery that um, is damaged in a collision or it's leaking, mm -hmm. The case that we have to bring this back safely is $15,000. The metal case with the beads and the chemicals inside of it to properly transport that battery. You're not going to have 1,000 dealerships, right, 1,000 of these containers there, right. floating around. So you're going to have to find someone to optimize the use of that asset, right? So I think this will be a little just sitting here today talking out loud, I think it'll be a little bit different. Um, I find it hard to make a business case that this is something we can do inside. If you have the opportunity to go meet with an autonomous ride-hailing fleet, do so, because many of them are already servicing some of their own vehicles at a very small scale. And their level of technological advancement and the focus that they have on all of the things that Anu was talking about, how do we keep the batteries safe? How do we keep the technology safe? They even have like a technology chain of custody for a lot of the computer systems that they put in the vehicles that many dealers are not capable of, many 3PLs may not be capable of, many of the OEM logistics networks may not be currently doing. So this matters to them. And they're interested in, a lot of these big fleet customers are interested in working with as few other parties as possible. So one of the questions that we got in this meeting with a ride hailing fleet was, well, who runs the warehouses for one of our manufacturer clients? And I told them, and they said, well, okay, that's good, because a lot of times we meet with somebody and they've outsourced it. 
So that's another factor that will present a challenge for 3PLs in the industry. And I don't know whether this is just an early stage problem that they feel like they need to overcome or whether they were being very cautious or if we didn't have the right person in the room. So this is obviously not a total deal breaker, but I think that a lot of these upstart fleets are interested in working with companies that they perceive as true experts and trying to cut down on the number of different companies that they have to interact with. I'm not sure what that'll look like in two or three years, but that is a factor right now. Yeah, and just one quick comment. I, I think I know where the question comes. Uh, Morgan Stanley analyst thinks of the future for 3PLs is fairly bleak that it's all going to go to the OEMs. I, I don't share that belief. I think, though, the expectations of providing the value added that you know everybody's talked about is, is going to be more and more critical. So the, the 3PLs got to add more value, and I think it might sort out the good and the bad, and that'll be better for everybody. Okay, any more questions? I've got a question for Jay about the, the parts distribution center. Um, is location the main factor in terms of making faster um, deliveries, or are you using technology like um, wearable technology and automation? Right now, we've focused a lot on our throughput with people. Actually, workers give us, we found more flexibility. We, we've been limited by our automatic storage and retrieval systems. So we've focused a lot on equipping employees with the tools to be successful. So that includes voice to pick, voice, you know, light, pick to light. So we've invested in our operations that way with some targets as well as, you know, throughput targets as well as quality targets. And that's how we know if we're going to be successful on it. Making the capital investment for some of those new technologies right now, um, we're looking at, but we're not actively investing in. We're, we're focused on um, moving closer to the customers. And one of the biggest things we did in our network was shift the work pattern so primarily, 10 years ago, our work pattern was primarily a first shift. So a 6 to 2.30 would be the bulk of the employees. Now our, our bulk of our employees are actually starting at 2 o'clock. So there's been a transition which has been huge in our organization to do that. But we found that a lot of the employees add a lot of flexibility <laughs> to going over to another area in picking or, 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 or packing versus receiving, so right now we're, we, we like the human element. Yeah, and just if I could add on to it, the location's always going to drive where it is to the customer, right? It's drive time. What's your, stock, what's your order cutoff time and when, right. how, what's the distance and when will the parts arrive, right? And in general, on the automotive side and on the uh, truck side, you want to have a later cutoff time and you want to get the parts there before the dealership opens so they can get the vehicle repaired out the next day, worst case scenario, right? You want high off the shelf fill for same day, but if you don't have it, you got overnight delivery, gets there before they open in the morning and you get the vehicle out. Um, now think about some of the restrictions that are out there in terms of drivers timing out, right? The government um, with the electronic logs and all that kind of stuff now, right? You get autonomous trucks, right? So we use team drivers. One time's out for the long hauls, right? Because location. If, you, if it's an autonomous truck, they don't time out. Yeah, nothing timing out. So the importance of location gets reduced, right? I mean, it's a mathematical issue, but at some point, you don't have to have a building within 400 miles of every customer that you have, right? Maybe it's 600. So I think there's some opportunity for some capital um, investment evaluation down the road with some more flexibility that we may have in delivery. Yeah, this is exceptionally important when you think about collision parts, which are bulky, hard to move, easily damaged, and extremely profitable for manufacturers. So the move towards autonomous vehicles, and this is from, the, from what you are retailing, not how you are transporting things, also affects how you put different parts in different warehouses across your network. So right now, you need to have your collision parts fairly close to the customer. Well, in five years, you may be selling very few collision parts, even if you are not, if you're in the audience and you're not a believer in autonomous technology. 
already we have a lot of safety technology like Toyota's safety sense that reduces uh, that car rear-ending another car by 90%, they're not going to sell a lot of front fascias for their cars in the upcoming year or two on new vehicles. So that affects how Toyota might want to structure their collision parts side of the network as part of the entire process. I wanted to also touch on something that Jay mentioned. Jay was talking about the importance of the human element. And I've been to Daimler's Dallas facility, and I was also struck by this. Like, there is, they have excellent people in this Dallas facility. And granted, I don't go to a lot of different warehouses, but we got a nice tour, and it was very impressive exactly what they had done. And there was a lot of flexibility, and people were very proud of where they worked. And that is hard to buy. So I think that is also something that's a factor. We usually see when people switch over to a new technology in the warehouse network, they see a productivity improvement. Sometimes when they get rid of a technology, they also see a productivity and a quality improvement because people are really paying attention. So there are a lot of technological advances that you can make, but I think it's almost impossible to see those gains without a very strong attention to your people and how they're actually operating processes regardless of the technology that's underlying everything. Yeah. I think one element also to think about is um, given how there is a shift in the usage of the vehicles, um, you know, the, the on-time delivery within the network is going to become much more critical. Right now, the cars that we own are probably used about 5-7% of the time we heard this morning. Most of the time, they're sitting in a driveway, in the garage, in the office, wherever. As we move over to shared economy and increasing amount of shared vehicles, if the, the utilization goes up to 30%, that puts a lot more pressure on the parts being delivered on time and the vehicle being um, treated as an asset, industrial asset, which has an uptime requirement, right? Because if it's down, it's, it's off-road, then it's not producing revenue. So that's gonna create more pressure in terms of what does your network look like? Where do you carry inventory? How do you deploy it? How do you get it to the dealer faster? Or maybe it's, you know, it's, it's a service network, which may be different, right? So, so where do you, how do you get it there uh, in a timely fashion where you're minimizing uh, you know, the downtime? And you know, there is already, I mean, we saw a little bit in the video um, that you had for Seat, uh, is there's, there's vehicle communication. You know, can you pre-order parts, right? So if I know there's a defect and I, and I have telematics uh, from the car, well, let me just make sure that I actually have a part at the nearest dealer. If I don't, then maybe I can go to the next dealer, right? So how do you how do you coordinate all of that to optimize uptime? Because that's going to become one of the critical success factors, um, you know, in the shared economy is uh, making sure the vehicle is um, available as much as possible. Yeah, we're already there with some fleets. They operate. Some of the trucks more than 20 hours. I'm sure some of the logistics companies in this room would love to see that, you know, as far as a truck running that long, just changing out the drivers. So a lot of what we're expected to do is that uptime. And we, we had the 72 hour challenge of over five years ago. Now the challenge is 24 hours. Um, that we're working with our dealer network on how to define what that would be. Because it, the trucks are more and more sophisticated you know, and one of the things I know a lot of people are like, when am I going to get an autonomous truck? We in the industry side don't necessarily like the word autonomous because, and, and I'm sure if you're a logistics company, you struggle to find drivers. But we found that, you know, when we say, hey, we're going to replace y'all with autonomous trucks, then how many people want to apply for that job? So what, we're, what we think right now for the foreseeable future, and that's like the next five to ten years, are more automated trucks. So like the brand new Cascadia that I showed right now, we sell 65% of those with, with a collision mitigation software. So actually to stop your car you know, for an accident is a lot quicker than stopping 80,000 pounds. And what we've tried to do is, so there's so many distracted drivers these days that they pull in front of trucks, they jam on the brakes, the driver can't react. We're trying to equip the trucks with the radar, the active systems that start braking before the truck driver reacts. So most of, like oh, right now I saw the take rate was about 
of our new truck sales are equipped with this collision mitigation as well as an active control system. So we think that driver assistance, there were over 330,000 accidents, if you think about it, with the truck business, and that's like three or four years ago. Every one of those comes with a downtime. It comes with a part not getting delivered. It comes yeah. with you know, the, the factory not getting parts, the retail store not getting parts. Most all of our commercial activity is delivered by a truck. So if we can reduce the amount of accidents and it, you know, that take time away, delivery, performance, everything else, we, we think that will help keep drivers in the trucks, help our, our partners, our customers um, in the long run. And Autonomous will develop over time. We, we had our first autonomous truck in 2015. We still drive it. Um, it's the first plated truck in Nevada. Um, best place for a lot of people, you know, and how you drive, but it, it actually gives us a lot of feedback on, on what's going on. But commercially viable autonomous truck right now doesn't look immediate. It could be five to 10 years or, or longer. But I think there are other opportunities like platooning where two trucks are following one lead truck with an operator. There's a lot of potential out there, but I, I think we want to look at how we best equip the current people. Just on the subject of people and talent, um, you know, there's this feeling that younger generations have better digital skills, but I'm wondering if they have any disadvantages as well when you're recruiting the the uh, digital natives, what kind of disadvantages are there and uh, what areas do they need more support? Hey, 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 it's a broad-ended question there. Um, how many people coming out of school today want to work for an automotive company? When I went to school, or University of Michigan, they were a truck company. <laughs> yeah, or trucks. Um, Ford, GM, Chrysler were the 800-pound gorillas. They were in the backyard here in Michigan and they had great training programs and they did a lot of recruiting. Um, when I go to campus to recruit now, it's what? Um, I was out in California when I was working for the Blue Oval, and they asked where I worked, and I said Ford, and they said, what's that? True story. Seriously? Right? Second most recognizable logo in the world, and you're asking me what? Um, all right, so I pass, right? You're not getting the job. The, the stuff you get into these days, right, companies with their compensation plans, because it all ties together. The average person coming out of school, I'm told, is going to work for seven to ten companies in their life. So you, turnover is, you don't have defined pension plans and people are more mobile and they look for different things and et cetera than they were when I was growing up. So you're going to have a lot of turnover. You spend a lot of time, money, training and investing in your personnel. Right? We got to get better at this. Right? I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to improve the retention. So the question is, how do you get that knowledge? And it's probably, there's, there's some aspect of it that's probably good because you're gonna get churn and new ways of thinking, right? We don't have that figured out, right? It's just, you know, we, our turnover today, depending on where you are, runs 10 to 30%, depending on what department you're in. You turn over people in a warehouse and you spend 40, 80 hours training them. Um, some warehouses have 100% turnover rate. Right, because Amazon built right across the street. We're, we're, we're a lot better than that. Yeah, no, but just, <laughs> you, you run into those types of things, right? So I, I think it's, it'll help um, get some new ideas in, just the natural turnover. To me, the, we just had, um, we, we hired a senior exec from Apple um, to run our IT office, and we just brought in a gentleman from Tesla. So why are they coming here? And you sit down, you have a conversation with them. The resources our company has attracts them, right? So that's good, right? So that's positive. Question is, how do you retain them, right? That'll be, that to me is going to be the big challenge. Right? Long, long worded answer to your question, but we're starting to get it because of the resources we have. Um, because we're not viewed as a manufacturer. Auto companies in general, I don't believe are viewed as black smoke coming out, manufacturing firms. The image has changed, right? You just saw the video we showed, right? Is that the typical Ford Rouge plant <laughs> video, right? It's about the customer experience. So I think the image has changed, which helps. 
Any comments from the floor? I think we have to wrap up shortly, so if you've got something to say, then uh, put your hand up. Yeah, question just there. Adam Pinyazic with Magna Powertrain. Are we thinking far enough in the future? It appears that most of the presentations are looking at the next five to 10 years. Where are we going in the next 25? I thought Jay made a really interesting comment about 3D printers. If you think about the service sector, if you had a 3D printer on steroids, you'd be less worried about how to move physical product. You'd be more interested in moving digital information as well as how you train your technicians in order to service more than just one vehicle. I think there is a change that we will see 10 plus years out, which is the impact that all of the data generated by transportation has and how it, we can monetize it as an industry. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think that presents a very positive light to current logistics business. General Motors is doing some very interesting things monetizing data. They've had the OnStar system in vehicles for as long as I can remember. They're collecting arguably more data off of more vehicles globally than any other OEM. And they're taking a lot of that information and using it to monitor and do a lot of the predictive telematics that we've been talking about here. So that's sort of a next five years aspect of it. But 20 plus years out, we may see a major transition over from paying per, you know, paying for fuel, paying for parts, to paying per mile, ultimately to getting into a vehicle, being marketed to, and going to your destination for a far lower price than we currently see. And I think this really, re of course, we'll still need logistics. The parts still have to run. The parts still have to go places. But I think it may change some areas of our business that we currently see as profit centers into cost centers, and some areas of our business that are either budding or non-existent, like the data monetization teams, may go from an area of exploration and research to a huge profit generator, and possibly the most high, like the highest profit margin aspect of the companies. Uh, obviously, I can't predict the future, but that's my guess based on some action that some current manufacturers are taking. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, I'll share another vantage point, which is, uh, you know, if we think further out uh, with urbanization and other global trends, you know, the demand's gonna be more on mobility, right? And, and as we shift over the powertrains, you know, imagine if you have a thousand cars which are now electric, um, to, to charge them, you know, each one is, let's say, you know, 50 kilowatts, right, battery, uh, you need, uh, you know, 50,000 kilowatts, right, which is 50 megawatts which is you know, a whole power station in itself, right? So if you go to you know, a big city like LA or New York or San Francisco or Dallas, you know, <clears throat> where do you get all that power, right? Um, where are you gonna put you know, 50 megawatt charging, mega charging stations, right? Uh, where, where are you gonna have the, uh, how is the infrastructure gonna support that, right? So those are some of the other conversations that are being had you know, at several of the smart cities conferences or uh, some of the other discussions that are looking 10, 15 years out and saying, let's say hypothetically we do achieve a 25% penetration rate um, in electric, you know, vehicles, forget about autonomous, in electric vehicles. So what, where do I, where do I, how do I manage them? How do I produce clean power to charge them, right? Now let's add a, the second component. Okay, now I assume 20, 30% penetration of autonomous, you know, level four autonomous vehicle, do I still need all the parking garages in the city? Really? I, I don't think I do, right? So how, do, how does the city make revenue uh, when there is a lot less parking tickets, then there's less parking, there is uh, less speed violations, so the photo cameras are sitting idle. Cities are going to lose, you know, 50 to $100 million in revenue just from the changes in technology that we are feeding into the vehicles now. So, so how does the infrastructure, the city, you know, the customer, the OEMs, the supplier, all work together to, to make it happen? So I think those are really, when you, you know, the question was, I think, uh, you know, are we looking further out? I think if you really look 15, 20 years out, I think those are some interesting questions that have to get answered. You know, 
how am I going to get you know, 300 megawatts in into one third of a city to charge all these vehicles? Where am I going to charge the trucks, right? So now maybe I have to set up um, you know, substations around the city so that I can have enough range that they can go back and forth, right? I can have maybe a different fleet for within city and have a different fleet, you know, across the country on the highway. So I think there is a there is a lot of thinking uh, going into it right now, um, and and certain countries are really jumping on it. I mean, I think um, we're seeing a lot of activity in, in the Middle East and and, and in Europe, uh, far more uh, honestly than you're seeing in the U.S. around smart cities and how to incorporate. Um, you know, all the different elements of bringing it together. Yeah, I mean, and just a quick add, to me the answer to the question is no, right, are we? But having said that, I'd say I don't know what's going to happen a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. Next week. So why am I thinking 15 or 20, 25 years out, right? And typically we're driven by our planning cycles, right? It's budgets and horizons and all that kind of stuff. Here's what I would say we got to get better at internally. We used to design and manufacture cars over a seven year time period, right? Then it went to five. Now it's at three and in some cases two. We just gotta get faster. It's a cultural mindset that we, the world is changing, mm -hmm. um, as you had said, very, very fast. And the old ways of thinking and processes don't fit or won't succeed. So change comes, we gotta react when we react. We gotta think faster or think ahead and do things faster, right? Faster and In prior lives, it, it used to take me 17 signatures to get stuff approved. Anybody ever try to get 17 signatures done? Right? Pre-electronic, by the way, right? So this piece of paper is being Walk carried around. around. Now, even with this, it's a six-month deal because everyone's got to have their own value add. This is simple, right? We just got to get faster to get the stuff allocated in our plannings, in our plans and in our budgets to go address this stuff. And he went, with the iPhones, what, 10 years old? Right, in that range, coming up on 11? Anybody mm -hmm. knew what that was gonna look like? Right, so if we're talking 20 years out, what the hell is that gonna look like? Okay, I think we're gonna have to continue that conversation over lunch because uh, we really have to wrap up now. Um, but thank you very much for some excellent presentations and some interesting comments. And. Uh, Lunch is just going to be outside and on the right. And thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, thank you.